Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Hi. Woo! So I'm, I'm really, really happy to be there. Thank you very much uh, to the organizers for uh, inviting me. I just want to, to know you a bit better. Can, can you raise your hand if you are a developer, for instance? OK. Uh, raise your hand if you know what uh, HTML5 is. OK, good deal. Raise your hand if you're excited to be there today. Everybody should raise their hand. OK, OK, good. So a bit, uh, a bit of background on who I am. Um, did, you, did you see um, this uh, Chrome ad? It was the ad for uh, the Chromebook. Who saw this ad? Can you raise your hand? OK, nobody saw the ad. It was, it was actually you know, the, the first ad for uh, the, Chromo, the Chromebook. Uh, with Chrome OS, and th this was this video which was very funny, where they take uh, a Chromebook and um, they basically, you know, destroy destroy it in several uh, different ways <laughs> uh, to show you that you know you can continue working even with a new Chromebook. You just have to log in, and what in in the video at some point, you know, there was um, so there was this guy who came and uh, who took the Chromebook uh, to a horrible death, right? OK, and at some point, I don't know if you saw, there was an equation there. Um, and with my, with my team at the time, uh, we, we also saw it. Uh, and we, we, tried to, we tried to solve that, and it was very funny. So if you, if you take uh, the equation on the right, you have the first, you know, uh, the first x equals, uh, and it's a very big number. And then we figured that what does this mean? Actually, we, we thought, you know, the URL shortener, goo.gl. Oh, maybe this is a URL, so let's try to translate it. And we actually found the URL well, where we won a Chromebook. So this was, a, this was a kind of introduction to the Google world. It was very funny. And you can read about it uh, on, this, uh, on this blog. So where we really am, um, I'm the founder of Jamendo, which is a Creative Commons music uh, community. I'm also the co-founder of uh, a company called Josh Fire, where we work on the Internet of Things. More on this uh, later. Uh, I also organize a lot of events, mainly in Paris. We do TEDx Paris. We do a, a big JavaScript conference at the end of the month. Uh, and I'm also a Google developer expert since uh, a few weeks, so I'm really, that's why I'm here. I'm really happy to be there and to, you know, to, to uh, meet you guys, all the Google communities around the world. And you can find me on Twitter, of course. So today, I want to, to talk you know, with you about HTML5. Um, you know, it's the next big standard for the web development. And when, when you create applications, you know, the, the, the first question, obviously, you ask yourself is which, which technology I, I will be using. And why, why should we know we bother with uh, HTML5? Because um, it's not for the performance. Uh, it's not uh, the best, you know, the, the most efficient platform after all. Uh, is it because it's easy? Yeah, HTML5 is easy, and uh, most of you have tried it. But for, for me, that's still not you know, the, the point. Is it because it's, it's standard? Is it because it's open? That, that, that's good, but like, won't change your app? Won't, won't make it better in any way? Uh, is it because it's fancy and it's, uh, it's fashionable? Probably, I don't know. No, uh, for me, choosing HTML5 is uh, because of the Internet of Things. So you ask, what is the Internet of Things? It's a, it's a bullshit uh, word. And there, there has been a decent, uh, a decent share of bullshit around the Internet of Things. This is, you know, a connected fridge. Have you heard about connected fridges? Yes, uh, have you seen one? Never. Uh, there is actually a blog with uh, <laughs> internet fridge.tumblr.com with all the failed attempts at uh, connecting a fridge. So this is not the Internet of Things I want to talk about. I want to talk about the, inter the Internet of Things we already live in. Uh, you know, the one where we have uh, the browsers, the one where uh, the smartphones, every kind of device you can think of that is already connected to the Internet, that is already intelligent, to me, that's the real Internet of Things. That the, that's the world we actually live in and the world we will live in tomorrow. And what I want to do as a developer is you know, to reach all these devices. 
even if they are a bit crazy, uh, they are Android watches. I don't know if uh, some of you are, have heard of that. Uh, now the cars are becoming connected also, uh, even when they have no driver, which is crazy. Uh, and some, some, some boards also. Um, we estimate that in 2020, there will be 25 billion connected objects to the internet. So thank God for IPv6, right? Uh, but this is, this is why uh, I, I, I chose HTML5 and I think it's the best platform to develop because with HTML5, you can actually develop for all these devices uh, with only one technology, which is crazy because never has, has it happened before that one technology was able you know, to, to reach so many different devices and almost all of them. Um, just want to, to, to go back on the last board I showed. Uh, who knows what, what this is? Raise your hand. Nobody knows. Okay. Uh, this is a Raspberry Pi. Ah. <laughs> so I actually took one with, with me today uh, just to show you guys. To me, it's really, like, it's really a glimpse of the future, really truly speaking. So this, this actually costs $25, so it's really cheap. And it has really the, you know, the, the, the same power as a computer maybe uh, of three, three, three years ago. Uh, you can run a video in full HD. Uh, it's, it's really crazy and it costs next to nothing. And if today, you know, it's a non-profit that is doing these things, if today this is the shape of a credit card and costs $25, imagine in, in two years, it will be, what, it will be cost maybe $10 and will be half the size. So these devices are going to be everywhere and we need a way to, to develop for them, to create apps for them, to make them intelligent, but to stay and to stay consistent with, with what we already do. We, we don't want to invent a new technology to develop for this. We want to use and to capitalize on what we already have. Um, <laughs> so this is not the question. The question today we ask is, does it run JavaScript, of course? Uh, and yes, it does. You know, the, uh, I, I'll explain later. This will be one of my devices that we'll conquer together. I will, I will show you uh, basically, you know, how, how can we target each and every one of these devices uh, with HTML5. Uh, the, the, the big issue, you know, when, when, you, when you try to do that, to target all these devices with just one technology, is uh, the fragmentation. Uh, and at all levels, I mean, the form factors are different, you know. You, you go from uh, smartphones to tablets to the web to TVs. So obviously you, your app is going to be different, you know. The, the promise is not that you will have one app that will run on every device the same. The app will be different, but the foundation and the technology you use uh, will stay the same. Uh, of course, you have all the problems about you know different platforms. Uh, a lot, they are obviously uh, not compatible between each other, so that, that's an issue for HTML5 development. Uh, all all the devices don't have the same level of performance, uh, the same engine, the same way of interacting. You know, some it's with a mouse, some it's touch. So it's a remote with only four buttons. So that's also going to change the app. And of course, we have the big issue of the SDKs. Uh, there are way too many you know, technologies to be, to be used on these devices. So wh what I will try to do is uh, to fight uh, with this fragmentation and to take a look at each big family of devices and see how with, with HTML5, we can, we can target them and we can be more efficient developers. So the first one, we're going to start with the one you know best, uh, are, uh, the desktop, of course. Um, so on the desktop, we have this thing called the web browsers. So I will now explain to you how a web browser works. I'm, I'm just kidding, I'm not going to do that. Uh, you already know the, the web browsers. Uh, it's it's, the, it's the, the, the platform the web uh, is built on. So on, on, on desktops, what we can do is we can have standalone apps. Uh, this is a different way you know, of uh, targeting the desktop. Um, so I, th there are a few technologies available to do that. There was a project by Mozilla called Prism. Uh, there are a few other you know, containers that take your web app and launch it as a standalone app so that you, you don't have to open a browser. You can directly open an, an app, which, which is kind of what you want when you, when you develop on desktop after all. Um, you have a bunch of other technologies. Uh, and of course, you have Chrome OS, where when you are with a Chromebook with Chrome OS, 
every app that you launch is actually an HTML5 web app. So this is, this is one of the new kind of devices that I would call you know, web native, is that wh whatever you do, you, you are on the web, you are already developing uh, your apps in HTML5. So th this is the desktop, but it's the, it's the most boring part. Um, when it becomes fun when we talk about servers and embedded uh, devices. Um, for a long time, you know, when we talked about HTML5 and JavaScript, it was always on the client side. It was always, okay, I'm in a web page. But with projects like, uh, I'm sure you all have heard of Node.js, um, the, the, the very same technologies were taken on the server side, and you can actually now develop the, quite the same apps that you did on the client side, but right from the server side, and maybe uh, send uh, you know your app already rendered as HTML to the client uh, without any logic on the client side. So this gives a great deal of flexibility. You you can choose where the logic of your app lives, either it's on the server or on the client. Uh, there are also Phantom JS, which is more like a headless navigator. And uh, so what what to do with you know this kind of stuff? Uh, we can. It's more, it's more like a server after all, but even if it has a HDMI output, what, what we, you know, what, what we uh, can do is um, we can build um, a custom Linux distribution that will boot the app uh, directly when you start the device. And with that, you know, you, you will be able to make, for instance, a, a kiosk. You know, you can, you can plug this directly behind the TV and make the TV intelligent and usable, you know, with, with an app you just made. So. The, you know, this, this device really has the power of making any display or any object intelligent. And uh, obviously most of the time you will end up uh, deploying a Linux uh, OS on this uh, and uh, doing your stuff. So there, there are other boards like uh, uh, the Raspberry Pi. Who has heard of uh, the Arduino? Okay, big tech crowd today. <laughs> no, the Arduino are basically smaller cards but uh, with a um, M much less powerful uh, processor that's not able to, to do JavaScript. So this is one of the examples where the HTML5 can't help us when you, the, the device is really uh, not powerful enough. There's just no way and you have to go back to like C or embedded uh, programming. But so the Raspberry Pi, as I said, you can do custom builds. You can use that in kiosks. Uh, it opens a whole lot of possibilities. So next, uh, the mobile and the tablets. So. All of you have a mobile, I think. Um, most of them probably are on iOS or Android. And to, to do HTML5 apps for these two kind of devices, it's, it's actually quite the same technologies. Both uh, are based on the WebKit engine. Uh, so you have, you know, you have um, a lot of power and a lot of standards already built in uh, the phone so that you can really develop uh, advanced apps. And you have basically two big solutions when you want to build an app for uh, mobiles and tablets. Uh, the first is uh, Apache uh, Cordova, which was called previously PhoneGap. Uh, PhoneGap, it's a, it's a library that takes an existing HTML5 app and that packages it into a native app for mobiles that you can then you know, publish on the Apple App Store, that you can publish on Google Play. And for the end user, they will really look like native apps. They, they, they won't see the difference, but you will have built them using HTML5. So that, that's a really big change because uh, before you had to, you know, to write uh, one app in Objective-C for iOS and one app maybe in Java for Android. Now with HTML5, you can actually build only one app and really the, the same app because it's, it, you know, the, the, the form factor is the same and uh, you can deploy it to, to two stores, so you actually end up winning a lot of time, and that's the, the main advantage of HTML5. You also have another technology which is called Accelerator, which is a bit different because the rendering is not done in HTML, but with native uh, renders, but it's a bit different. Next, we have also Windows 8. Uh, I'm sure you saw that Windows 8 was released not too long ago. Um, and Windows 8 actually speaks JavaScript natively. You have a framework that's called WinJS uh, that allows you really a, a deep integration with the operating system. You can, you can read files, you can write files, you can interact with the, you know, with the OS, with the processes. You can do pretty much whatever you want to do uh, as an app, all in JavaScript with just one API. So this is really huge, and uh, it will be really a, a huge um, factor of adoption for HTML5 in the future, if Windows 8 succeeds, of course. I'm, I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, saying anything. Um, the thing is, when you use WinJS, 
um, that it's still a bit of a problem because it's a speci very specific engine. And for instance, you can't use jQuery, which is the most popular JavaScript uh, library. You can use jQuery directly. You have to, to do a few patches because the engine is very specific. But th that's issues that will be solved, I'm sure, very soon. Um, on mobiles, so th this was for desktop and tablets. On mobiles, we don't have yet WinJS. Uh, the next versions will have it, but not yet. So for now, you have to use Cordova like on iOS and Android. But this will be, this will be fixed soon. So what about mobile operating systems where the web is actually you know, the, native, uh, the native development platforms and the main, uh, the main development platforms? Because after all, you know, even on iOS and Android, using you know, a native container like, like PhoneGap to insert your HTML5 app inside, it's a bit of a hack. You know? it's, not, it's not the native way of doing it. It's not even the recommended way of doing it, even, even if, it's in, if it gives very good results. So wh what about you know, future mobile operating systems that will take the web as a native uh, SDK? Uh, well, there is already one. Uh, maybe you know WebOS from HP. Uh, all the apps were done in HTML5 and even Node.js. There is an upcoming project you know, by Mozilla, which was called Boot to Gecko, but has been renamed, I think, uh, Firefox OS, uh, which will, will be, just like iOS, a mobile operating system, but built on Mozilla technologies. And of course, the apps, you guessed it, will be uh, HTML5 native. There is also another project called Tizen, uh, but it's, it's uh, I don't know what will, what will be developed. <laughs> it's a bit less, uh, a bit less used. So now the, the, the real like uncharted territory and the smart TVs. So the smart TVs are, are really interesting, you know, uh, when, when we when we try to analyze HTML5 because it's it's actually you know the last platform uh, to be uh, to have been developed. You know, like uh, three years ago there was no smart TVs, uh, and the first smart TVs really appeared in 2009. So it even appeared after you know after the iPhone and. Uh, all the um, all the mobile stuff. So it's it's actually the last platform uh, to uh, to uh, to have been born, and uh, as such, it's very interesting to see that the ecosystem uh, for HTML5 or even generally speaking uh, development on these TVs is still very very young, and uh, you will see um, uh, with all the brands uh, what is the current status of this. So the first uh, smart TV I want to talk about, of course, is the Google TV. Um, which of you know about Google TV? Raise your hands, please, be there. Okay, cool. Uh, so Google TV, it's a, it's a recent uh, development by Google. It's actually uh, mostly uh, boxes, you know, that you plug to your TVs. Some TVs also have it natively. Uh, and you basically have Android uh, on your TV, uh, which means if you follow that uh, you can use uh, Cordova, uh, the, the same phone gap uh, project, uh, to build apps. It already works, you know, right from the release of Google TV, you were able to build uh, HTML5 apps with that. And really, it's, it's kind of the best platform and the most advanced platform uh, as, as a smart TV because, of course, it has Chrome, which is uh, one of the best uh, browsers around. It has the most powerful engine. It has a V8 uh, engine, which is very fast. So you can really, you, you don't have as much, you know, technical limitations uh, as we'll see later on other platforms on Google TV. Um, there are on, only two main problems for developing you know, uh, really high quality apps on the Google TV right now. The first is that still you, you can't access all the features of the TV. Like it's, it's quite hard you know, if you want to embed a, a live stream of a video and to do something with your app. It's still a bit difficult. You, you can do whatever you want. And of course, the second most problematic uh, thing is that it has a very low market share. Um, so that, of course, has to be solved if you, if you want to be interesting as a platform. The, the next platform I want to talk on, and which is really interesting, is uh, the Samsung Smart TV. So it's always the same look. Huh? The, the screenshots are <laughs> all the same. But um, Samsung is really interesting uh, for a lot of reasons. First, it was w one of the first smart TV platforms. And also, it has around 60% market share in the connected TVs, which is huge. Uh, every time you want to develop a smart TV, the, the first reflex should be like to develop for Samsung, because that's the way currently that you will reach the, the most people. Uh, so what to do when, when you actually want to develop an app for, like for, 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 for Samsung TV? Well, you start by, of course, uh, downloading the SDK. Uh, then there is documentation, which is, which is huge. Which is huge. Uh, 
Uh, you also have an emulator so that you can test, you don't have to buy a, a TV. Um, and what's interesting is that once you develop, you have, uh, um, you have uh, you know, access to some APIs of the TV. For instance, you know, of course, the TVs have a very high quality video component that, that you want probably to use in your apps. So you have a JavaScript API to use this and uh, your applications can benefit from all the features of the TV and uh, use, use the performance. Uh, there are lots of specs if you want to check out. Um, and the, the problem with Samsung TV, uh, which is that, you know, it has the huge market share, so you, uh, you absolutely want to develop, but uh, it's, it's separated into, you have the first, the 2010 and 2011 models. That, that was what, the, what we had, you know, two, uh, one or two years ago. And the, en the engine, you know, the HTML5 engine that powers the TV was a very weird thing. Uh, it was like a fork, a, f a fork of Firefox 2.5, heavily modified by Samsung for the TV with patches in Korean inside. It was really, uh, really, really hard to, to understand. F and you, you, you got things like this, like for the forms. Th that's what the forms look like when you try to, to do forms in your app. Uh, it was completely unusable. The focus wa was off. Uh, it advertised that it supported HTML5, <laughs> good, uh, but it was like partial support, and when you really try it, partial supports mean that, for instance, you can use the video tag, but you won't have, uh, you know, you won't have different parameters for source, you won't have controls, basically it's, it's useless. Um, so th this is a big headache. Uh, the results on, on the emulator, you know, that you can install on your PC are widely different from what you get on TV, you know, sometimes the video won't, won't work at all, sometimes there will be bags on the emulator, but not bags on the TV. Another fun instance, like the maximum Z index is 99. <laughs> what? Uh, so you, you, you can't really, you know, it's, it's like a subset of HTML that you can use, and it's not advertised before, so, uh, I, you know, as a developer, two years ago, uh, developing on Samsung TV, it was really like uh, the, the, the Wild West, you know, you, had you, you would start your app from scratch and then build, you know, things little by little, by little and once something breaks, okay, this breaks, I have to work around. It, it was really chaotic, that, that, was, uh, that was really hell. Um, fortunately, uh, Samsung evolved and um, with, you know, with each iteration and that, that's where you really see, you know, the platform being born. Uh, the, the, the improvements were made at each platform and now in 2012 we actually have a WebKit engine with a, a nice JavaScript uh, engine. You can do CSS3, you can do WebSockets even on the TV. Um, the SDK is better, the websites you, you don't have to be Korean to understand them now, it's uh, more or less translated in English. So, okay, you, now you, you, can, you can begin to work, for, to work with that. Uh, the community is huge. Um, there are lots of APIs, even, you know, face recognition APIs. So you can really see that, you know, the platform is really be, being developed and pushed forward and becoming to, to be, you know, interesting uh, as a developer. Uh, uh, lots of pains, of course, but you, you can begin to work with it. I will, I will skip, you know, very quickly the other platforms. I think you get the point, you know, uh, with uh, this description of Samsung. All the other ones are, you know, a bit less advanced right now than Samsung, but basically face the same issues and the same uh, revisions. So LG, it has a WebKit engine, some CSS3. It has something fun, which is called the Magic Remote, you know, which has a, a, a gyroscope, which is, you know, you can point on the TV, which is a, a bit fun to develop for. Uh, then you also have Sony. Uh, Sony, the very same as Samsung, had one old platform, which was called uh, Bravia Internet Video, which was a uh, total crap. Uh, and they understood this. Uh, nobody wanted to develop for, they, for, for it. And so 2012, they released a new platform which is called Sony Entertainment Network, which this time is based on Opera, which is a more modern and standards compatible navigator. So the same nowadays, it's actually, you know, and doable to, to develop good apps for Sony TVs. Then you have Philips uh, Net TVs, uh, which share their SDK with low, Love and Sharp. Uh, also use Opera, and then you have, you know, a whole lot of other platforms, you know, uh, Toshiba, um, Yahoo Connected TV, wh whatever that is, um, crazy. Uh, Panasonic, you know, uh, Sharp, and even Ubuntu, uh, Canonical has recently announced that will be th they will build a platform for TV. So as you can see, you know, we have seen at least uh, 10 of them now. There are lots of, you know, uh, platforms for developing apps for TV now. They are being born, you know, uh, they are fighting together. S Samsung appears to be like the king uh, currently. 
But of course, that could change <laughs> if uh, someday we get, you know, an Apple TV that is actually an Apple TV. Uh, I mean, uh, the ITV. You know, um, this, this is really interesting. Uh, it's, it's a really interesting moment for smart TVs because ev everything could, could still happen. You know, if you remember, like mobile developments before the iPhone. Everybody thought that, okay, mobile development, it's a small Java apps, uh, they are basically useless. Then the iPhone came around and opened the eyes of everyone and uh, a whole new industry was starting. So maybe, I, I don't know the answer of course, maybe when the ITV uh, probably comes, I don't know, uh, it will again change completely the landscape. Even if uh, this new device doesn't get you know, as much market share as Samsung, uh, Apple, uh, as we know, has the power you know, to, to, to get shifts uh, in the market and, you know, to, to really sh shake things up. So that could still change. Um, I'll pass very quickly. There are a few alliances that are being developed to unify the SDKs. Uh, maybe they will work, maybe not. I don't know. This is a French uh, initiative from France Television, uh, which is, I don't know, probably doomed to fail. Uh, it's kind of trying to merge broadcast with uh, internet access and develop hybrid apps. I don't know. Uh, you know, it's, it's really everything could happen basically at this point. But right now, if you still want to develop apps, the safe bet would be to start with Samsung TV and then do maybe probably uh, LG and uh, Google TV. If you do these three platforms, you will have covered maybe 80 to 90% of the market in, uh, in most countries. So th this is you know, what you can do on quite every device with HTML5. Some are very advanced, like the, the mobile operating system. Some are still very young, like the smart TVs. Um, so clearly, you know, this is the technology, but the problem you're faced, you know, when, when you try to develop such apps is uh, you, you basically need tools. You know, you, you want, you, maybe you, you, you can, but it's very hard to write apps you know, from scratch every time. So for this, you have two kinds of tools, basically. You know, you have the UI frameworks, you know, uh, libraries that help you create your app more efficiently by, uh, you know, sharing code. A few of them, for instance, jQuery Mobile uh, can do uh, pretty good applications. A new framework from, from HP, which is pretty good, called AnyoJS. Um, the first one, the first big one that was born was uh, Sencha Touch, uh, which uh, reproduces the native look and, fi look, look and feel of iOS and Android, which is pretty good. I'm a fan of Backbone.js also, but this is personal. So there, there are lot, lots of frameworks you can use, and uh, you know, in, in JavaScript, uh, you, it's not a new language anymore. You know, it's uh, it's really mature. I think it's now the number one language on GitHub. Uh, so you really have this huge community that's ready to help you develop your apps. So this is not really the problem. The problem for me is like more the tool chain, the tools you, you really need, you know, to build the apps. Because if you if you really want to 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 do an HTML5 app on every device, then you will need to install Xcode. So that means having a Mac, but you will also need, you know, to develop for Windows 8 to have a Visual Studio. So that means having a, a PC, and you also need probably for Android to have Eclipse. Uh, and for the TVs, most of the time it's uh, Windows only SDKs. Uh, Sometimes in Korean, uh, it's uh, very difficult. So no, <laughs> no. You, you know, if, if we are really, if we really want to be serious about, you know, having one platform, having you know, one solution for every device and really conquering them. We, we need, you know, to have better tools and to work uh, on simplifying, you know, the life of developers. Because if I want to be a multi-device, a cross-platform HTML5 developers, and you tell me you have to do this, I won't do it. Uh, I will do maybe one, one platform, two platforms, but the real, the real promise of HTML5 won't, you know, won't be, won't be happening. Uh, so this is where I do some uh, publicity for my, some advertising for my company. Uh, wh what we did, you know, was we, we, we found out uh, this problem and we basically built, you know, an online solution that we call the Joshua Factory that um, uses all these SDKs and runs them in uh, virtual machines in the cloud for you so that if you want to develop apps for all those devices, you can just, you know, have your favorite code editor, send your code uh, to this uh, factory and we'll build them for you. We'll, you know, we, we have crazy Windows SDKs with all the, the Korean stuff. We manage that for you. And you can you know, uh, download in return the built apps directly installable on the devices. 
So this is one example of a tool that is really invaluable for HTML5 development. I'm sure there will be others. Uh, for instance, uh, Adobe uh, bought Cordova and they built uh, a tool called uh, uh, PhoneGap Build, which uh, has the, quite the same principle. You, know, you upload your application in HTML5, they build it for every mobile platform with PhoneGap and then you download uh, you know, the IPAs and the APKs, uh, APKs for Android. So this is the kind of tool we need and there, there we need to be working so that we can use the HTML5 to, to its uh, potential. So what, what, what's next? What's the, you know, what's the way forward? And I will finish on this. Uh, still missing from HTML5 in my mind is uh, DRMs. Uh, this is a very controversial topic because you have the advocates who, who will say no, uh, no DRM on HTML5, please, uh, it will be toxic for the platform. But in the end, you know, uh, it's, it's up to the developers really. And if you know all the, all the content um, which has DRMs, you know, from the big studios, from the big companies, they own this content and they, they won't publish it unless uh, they can attach DRM to it. Uh, pro probably that it's stupid uh, from, from them, but that's the reality now, you know. Um, if we don't have this into HTML5, we, we will be effectively limited by the kind of app we can develop we won't be able to build uh, the next YouTube maybe or the next video platform if we don't have DRMs in HTML5. So that, that's for me a, a big topic. Another one was uh, the, you know, having native sockets for doing network stuff. But now we do have WebRTC, which is a spec you know, from Google you may have heard of, which allows to do you know, P2P uh, and video calls in the browser. So th that, that's for me really exciting. And honestly, I, I don't know what next, you know, maybe, uh, some, some new API will come and they will benefit you know, all the devices uh, that use HTML5. The, um, the thing is, if you want to use all this, you have to, you know, to, to have a consistent support from all the devices. I would say the main threat to HTML5 is that you know, every platform supports a partial version of HTML5 and creates you know, lots of problems for developers and it becomes a nightmare and to, to a point where you say, okay, HTML5 is too much fragmented Everybody supports it uh, in a different way. I want to go back to, you know, to doing one supported stuff for each platform. That's for me, that is the main threat. But I hope you know, we, all, the, all the manufacturers will work together to have a consistent HTML5 implementations. And what's next to conquer? Basically, uh, some, you know, some set-top boxes that connect on the TVs that don't support HTML5. Maybe the readers also, uh, you know, the Kindles and the Nooks. Uh, they have basic browsers, but you can't develop apps yet for them, even if you know EPUB is actually an extension from HTML. So maybe there, there are stuff to be done for these platforms. And the, the last one, uh, which should be promising, but is still a bit locked right now, are uh, the consoles. Uh, if we could develop you know, HTML5 apps for the Xbox and for the PS3, that we know would open up a whole new market and uh, reach a lot, more, lot more people. So that's, you know, that's the territory we still have to conquer. And I'm hoping some of you, you know, may help uh, hacking into these devices and, you know, bringing the open web uh, to everybody. Thank you very much. Simple jobs to simplify for this computer. So what, HTML5. What, what I meant is the Arduino is not powerful enough, you know, to <coughs> to run JavaScript inside the Arduino. You, know? you have to you have to develop in it's a, it's a language like C, which because the processor is is very slow on the Arduinos. So you, you know, even if you you can communicate with an Arduino from HTML5, but I wouldn't say that means you know that uh, you can develop apps in the Arduino with HTML5. Um, that, that's a big limitation, and that's something you can do with the Raspberry Pi, which is, which is about the same price. You know, it's, uh, both are about $25. So what, if you have the choice, wh why not pick the most powerful one, you know, if it's the same price? So I think the, the future is more, is more like in Raspberry Pis than in Arduinos. That's why. Thanks. 
Thanks for your presentation. It was uh, very impressive. Um, so my question is, uh, what do you think about uh, porting uh, uh, desktop application uh, to the web? Uh, for now, we've got uh, two uh, main projects. Uh, it's uh, Adobe Alchemy, which uh, uh, became uh, Adobe Flask for porting C++ code to client, uh, uh, to browsers. And the second is uh, Mozilla's work is mscripting. So, uh, but we still need uh, one common solution, I think. And uh, what is uh, your thoughts about that? Thank you. It's it's a very interesting question. You know, um, there, there are a lot of, as you said, you know, uh, tools that can help you take like C plus plus or even Java code and port them, you know, and translate them automatically to JavaScript. For instance, also GWT, you know, Google Web Toolkit translates from Java to JavaScript. So um, I, I think it's, it's, it's um, probably even like irrelevant, uh, you know, what you, what you use as a developer, you know, uh, in, a, in, in your like basic language. As long as wh what you do is, uh, um, is e as long as it's possible to, you know, to translate what you do into JavaScript and that the tools are good enough, you know, to, to make useful applications in the end, uh, if, if the platforms that you are going to target support you know, JavaScript and HTML5, then the, the, the end users you know, won't, won't see the difference. For, for them, it will just run and they, they, won't, they won't ask any question. And, and for you, it will have been you know, uh, easy enough. I think the, 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 the main, the main uh, problem of these tools is that they, they introduce a lot of complexity. You know, you, if, you, if you have you know, already a huge project, maybe in C++, and you use mscript and to compile it to JavaScript, if you want to debug <laughs> the resulting JavaScript, you have really to be a, like a, you have to be a Russian hacker, you know, to to be able to do that. You know. I, I wouldn't be able to do to do that myself. So, um, if I think if if you really um, if you are really um, um, proficient in, in the tool, and for instance, I, I think with Google Google Web Toolkit, it, it's less of a problem because uh, you know it's uh, it's much more uh, robust and modern. And, and maybe the, the, the programmers that, that use this in Java uh, already thought you know, from the beginning that they would be using Google Web Toolkit, just they write in Java, but they thought at the beginning for the web. Whereas most of the time when you use mscript n with C++ code, it's, it's to port code that was not made for the web in, in the first place, and you try you know, to, <laughs> to, uh, to do something uh, unholy you know, and push it into the, into the web. So, the, the, the most successful examples I've, I've seen it work is, for instance, uh, uh, there was a voice uh, synthesis uh, platform, you know, that was transcribed uh, in Enscript M that I used once. And you can, you know, so you have this big, big, big file of JavaScript, like uh, like two megas of JavaScript, completely unreadable, but you, you can pass it text and you, uh, with HTML5 audio, you, you hear the sounds of what you just said. So this kind of tool, you know, it can work and maybe it will be much too long to develop a full voice, you know, uh, voice uh, synthesis software in JavaScript. So f for some kind of usage, it can work. But uh, as a whole, I, I think you really have you know, to embrace HTML5. And if you want to develop for the web, you know, ju just use the right tools. Thank you. So, so my question is, um, you're saying that HTML5 is something that is really huge for the society and for maybe website. But uh, how is it common now? And uh, what is it? Okay, no, it's a, it's a, it's also a good question. Um, I, I think uh, maybe two years ago it clearly wasn't ready. You know, uh, if we if we even just look at one of the you know the smartphones, just just taking this example with the smartphones, you know, uh, two years ago maybe we had the iPhone 3GS, uh, maybe uh, the first iPhone 4s. Honestly, on the iPhone 3GS, uh, when you built an app using HTML5, couldn't be as responsive, you know, as a native app. So it, it would be, you know, it would be uh, a huge uh, ga uh, saving of time to develop in HTML5, but you, you wouldn't be able really to reproduce the quality that you got using, uh, using Objective-C, for instance. Now, you know, with iPhone 4, 4S, and 5, I've actually you know, shown apps to people that were done into HTML5, and I, I can show you one also now, and they sh couldn't you know, tell the difference uh, because you, you, you know, the, the technology and the engine and the power of the device got to a point where 
uh, you know, it's so powerful, basically, that, uh, you know, the, the HTML5 engine is really capable, you know, of doing transitions on being really responsive. And so, as long as, you know, you develop uh, with the guidelines of the platform, you, you can actually do apps on mobile right now on the latest phones that are really indistinguishable from, from native code. That is, of course, if you are not doing a 3D game where you shoot uh, zombies or what, this won't work into HTML5, of course, uh, for now. Uh, but if you know, if you want to do simple enough apps and, you know, like media apps where you browse into videos and, you know, like newspaper apps or whatever kind of apps but 3D games, basically, then uh, on mobiles you, you are already at the point where it's, uh, it's really there. On smart TVs, it's a bit different. I wouldn't say that the, you know, the, the support is, uh, is good enough right now, <laughs> but it's the other problem because it's the only one we got. You, know? you, you can't actually develop on smart TVs with something else than that uh, HTML. So you are, you are just left with that and you have, you know, you have, to, you have to use this. So you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's maybe a matter of years that uh, on all the smart TVs you get to a really high performance HTML5 implementations. We are you know, beginning to see the first platforms, Samsung 2012, Google TV are already in you know, a very good quality. The other ones, maybe in a few years. But uh, you know, mobile, web, and tablets, you can already be safe. Uh, may I ask you a question about uh, Jamendo? Oh, yes, please. Uh, you said uh, you're a founder yes. of Jamendo.com. Uh, and uh, I'm a frontman of Arms Linux User Group. And uh, can you sing? And, uh, can you sing? Can can you sing a song? <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> good, 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 good jacket, good jacket. Uh, and I and my comrades are very bothered about freedom and uh, in uh, internet and in program sphere and. Uh, uh, we are, uh, want to ask you a question about uh, why in Jamendo there's no possibility to download files in OG and FLAC format. <laughs> why so? <laughs> so? It's a good question. Uh, so this is going to be a bit off topic <laughs> from my presentation, but I, I, I'll take the question. Um, so basically, you know, the, the history of Jamendo, we, we, we started you know, as, a, as a very young company. And uh, so Jamendo is, uh, you know, a platform for hosting music files. And uh, at the beginning, we supported, you know, only MP3. And then a bunch of us, you know, were on uh, Linux and uh, wanted to use the website. And it was complicated because there were, in most distributions, you know, there was no support for MP3, actually. Uh, so, you, you know, adding OG was, you know, it, it was not really like a statement for freedom. Or, you know, it, it was not like political or religious. It was more like coming from, from a need, you know, from users. Um, we, we, we always, you know, saw ourselves, you know, as, you know, pragmatists uh, rather than ideologists, you know. And even if, of, of course, you know, the platform was, you know, uh, was encouraging freedom and Creative Commons licenses and, you know, acting, I think, for the greater good, we, we always try, you know, to, to make something that the, the users, you know, could reuse and that would be targeted for the users. And and we, we got to a point, I think it was like three years ago, where uh, basically when, when we run the stats you know, of MP3 usage and OG Vorbis usage, I think OG Vorbis was 0.1% uh, of the streams that we, we sent. And for us, it, it was costing us you know, the, the same price in hosting. And um, I think the cause of this was that, you know, right now, I think every distribution of, of Linux, when you install it, it already has an MP3 implementation, almost all of them. And um, there is also the fact that, may, like in a few years, I, I think the MP3 will actually be patent free, you know. So this will be <laughs> this will be an old problem, you know. But yes, for, for uploading files, you, uh, your service demand, uh, demands uh, yes, fl 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 yes. flat version. Flat version. Uh, I think uh, lo lossless uh, formats are po popular now. So we, 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 asked, we were always asking for flax or waves when uploading because we wanted to have the highest quality possible you know, for the music to be able you know, in the future to, uh, to transcode it to every format that we wanted or maybe even one day to, to give flax for download. Um, and we, we actually tried it you know, at one time. It was called at some point virtual goods on uh, Gemendo and the people could, you know, could uh, tip 
and give a few dollars to the artist and then download the flags. And it wasn't popular at all. Like, when, you know, when, when, we, when we had this feature, basically, nobody cared you know, about the flags. And, and it, it, was, it was a big deception for us because we had spent a lot of time you know, building the feature and we said, okay, our users, you know, they are audio enthusiasts. They love you know, high quality audio. And very, very few of them actually use this feature. So the, the, this, was, this, was, this was like a deception for, for us too. Uh, and and I, I think it, you know it's it's a maybe a good lesson for for open source as a whole. You know, is that qu when you, when you have like a, a service like ours, and even with you know with the best intentions, we you know we, I, I basically made this platform you know to to contribute to Creative Commons. Uh, that was you know my, my main my main uh, point. You, you still have to, to get to a point where you are economically sustainable. You know, uh, it's still a company. Uh, we have 15 employees, so you have to make, make you know make them. Pay, pay them, and if you know if the if the end users uh, don't actually want you know the features that that, that you give them, if if they, even if they are good and they are freer than you know other options, then it's not sustainable. I think the the work has to be done on educating people. You know uh, why uh, why is flag better? Why is Ogverb is better? You know before uh, uh, it can be sustainable to support these kind of formats. So it's it's a bit of a chicken and egg problem, you know. But we we, we tried doing it and we had very very low re very very low reception. So. If but uh, sure, Sylvain, uh, uh, Android programmer, and that's all that I can say in your native language. So let's continue in English. Well, you said that. Um, HTML5 is good enough for creating mobile application for Android or iOS uh, devices. But we have one great uh, pitfall in these cases. If we have something uh, that we can't uh, deal with uh, HTML5, like some hardware capabilities or like some issues that uh, not presented in current version of WebKit, we need to go back to native code we need to link it with our HTML5 apps. Mm -hmm. So if we have uh, HTML5 app and we want to develop it, we want to make it grow, and we want to add some new features, it, it's a um, bit risky uh, to uh, be on HTML5 from the very beginning. It's good for prototyping, but uh, growing of the app uh, will be risky because we need uh, a specialist that is uh, uh, highly, uh, I know, uh, have a good knowledge as of HTML5 and as of native code. What do you think about this? So you you, you do need great knowledge of HTML5, you know, to, to develop for, for instance, for mobiles. You know, what, uh, as you see in my presentation, I, I never said it like it was easy and that was you know the, the easy solution. Uh, what I'm what I'm telling is that it's the only solution to develop you know for all devices. And on mobiles, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not that simple to, to do an app that, like I said before, that feels like a, like a native app and that has, you know, the same, the same quality that, that, than a native app. It's, it's not easy, like you, you have to use uh, some, maybe some frameworks, you have to, to have a good designer, you know, and interaction designer people. So it's, it's not really the problem, you know, of the, of the difficulty because it is difficult. Um, wh wh what you said, you know, about, uh, about native code, is, uh, is interesting, you know, basically w when you have a project, you, you, I, I think you know PhoneGap, right? Uh, yeah. yeah, I know so something about this. Okay. So just, just very quickly. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so very quickly, you know, PhoneGap, basically, w w what is PhoneGap and uh, Cordova? You know, it's, it's a container for the HTML5 apps but that is made entirely itself of native code, you know, of course, and that exposes, you know, uh, features uh, from the native, you know, the native view, like the acceleration, the, the geolocation, uh, all features like, thi like this, to the, the JavaScript. Uh, if, if you want to add features, or if you want to be sure that, you know, in the future, uh, new features will be supported by your app, you can actually do Cordova plugins, you know, you can write your own native code, that talks, you know, to the HTML5. So what you end up doing is hybrid apps, you know, where you have the, the most that you can in HTML5, and you, you share between all platforms the very same core of code. And then 
when you are on a platform where you want to go, you know, uh, all the way to, to what a native app can do, then you can you can use uh, you know plugins uh, to you know to to intercept the web view and to add features. Well, well, we did once an app where you know you you had a, it was a simple mobile app, but at one point you had a, you know a immersion into a 3D environment. You know you could move the phone and and see uh, see around you. D this we did in, into native. You know we we created a, a plugin. We wrote it in Objective C and uh, in Java for Android. Uh, but it still allowed us, you know, to continue doing the rest of the app in HTML5, and just where we needed, use uh, use native code. So in this kind of hybrid apps, you, you get both benefits. You get you get the simplicity and the, you know the 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 sharing of code for HTML5, but you can still use the native features when you really need it. So that, that's a good security for the future. Thank you very much.